And now it's my great pleasure to introduce Frank Lowenstein. Frank currently serves as the Chief Operating Officer of the New England Forestry Foundation. He has played a critical role in overseeing and advancing their climate change mitigation and adaptation work. He also leads their exemplary forestry center, which seeks to maximize the contributions of New England's forests to mitigate the damaging climate impacts of climate change. Frank is a Switzer fellow, a former senior fellow in the US Department of State's Energy and Climate Partnership of the Americas and he's also the author of three books. It's my great pleasure to introduce Frank Lowenstein. Thank you, Scott, and thanks all of you who have come here today. I'm gonna to go ahead and uh, share my screen, um, which hopefully I get the right one. That should be showing now. And uh, one of my fellow panelists, I'm sure, will tell me if not. Um, so uh, I made the screen green for St. Patrick's Day and I hope all of you have a very pleasant one and uh, are able to celebrate in whatever fashion suits your, uh, your desires. Um, I wanted to uh, first start by amplifying a bit on the climate challenge in front of us. Um, Scott gave us a very nice three-legged stool. What's behind that three-legged stool though is really changes in so many aspects of our lives. The cars we drive, the way we heat our homes, maybe the way we cook our food, uh, and for sure the way we think about forests. And we haven't gone far enough yet at a global level. Uh, this graph shows the pathway of emissions over the last five years and what would sort of continue to happen by 2030 on a global basis. Uh, the orange line here is the commitments the countries have made under the Paris Climate Accords to date. And you can see that that would flatten emissions in the next 10 years. That is not nearly enough. The science says that we need to go much further. We need to get uh, follow this line, uh, this lower line, down to uh, about half of our current emissions over the next 10 years. That's a very big challenge. We need to get rid of 187 gigatons of expected emissions in, over the course of the 10 years. So looked at another way, this is a figure from John Foley, a project draw, drawdown. In the next 10 years, we need to cut emissions equivalent to the increase in emissions that has occurred uh, over the 50 years since 1970. That's a huge challenge. We have a lot more people, a lot more economic activity a lot more energy use than we had in 1970. And it doesn't stop there. Um, uh, but we, we cut it 50% in the next 10 years, we cut it 50% more between 2030 and 2040 and 50% more by 2050. And we still have 12 and a half percent of today's emissions. The way we get to net zero is to add carbon removal to that picture. And that is where forests and trees come into play. We still can't fully emulate photosynthesis. Trees are the world's best technology for carbon removal. Yeah, that's it, that's it. You know, forget about Twitter, forget about advanced supercomputers, it's a tree. That's our best technology and we need their help and we will need their help beyond 2050. We will need to continue to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Um, and we'll need trees for something else, which I would advocate is a fourth leg to uh, Scott's four-legged, uh, three-legged stool. Four-legged stools are more stable. Um, the fourth leg beyond renewable energy, conserving energy, removing CO2 from the atmosphere is renewable materials. Just as we need renewable energy, we need renewable feedstocks for all the products that society needs. And trees do that for us. Trees store carbon, they turn light into wood, storing carbon in their, their very fiber. Uh, and we can then carefully, respectfully harvest wood and use it as a feedstock for the materials we need for society. And with new technologies, 
that are coming into play today and have been in play today and have been in play particularly in Europe over the last 15 years, we can now build large buildings out of wood using engineered wood products like cross laminated timber panels like you see on the lower left here. The world's largest cross laminated timber building, 25 stories tall, is going up in Minneapolis this spring. Um, so this is, a, this is a new opportunity for us and I'm gonna speak a little bit to why it matters. Um, so first of all, between 1961 and 2017, the world population grew almost two and a half fold. Wood use grew only 1.6 fold. In other words, the per capita wood use declined. But meanwhile, the use of what I call the three horsemen of the climate apocalypse, uh, steel, cement, and plastics, uh, the uses of those three soared. We need to change that pattern. So at New England Forestry Foundation, we think about it this way. We think about it as an equation that we need to end forest conversion to maintain the carbon dioxide that's already stored and to also allow us to continue to have that sequestration ability of forests beyond 30 years from now. We need to use better quality forestry. We've put out a, a, an approach that we call exemplary forestry. There are other approaches out there. Um, exemplary forestry isn't the only way to do it. It's one way to increase the productivity of the forest, the actual amount of carbon dioxide removed from the atmosphere per acre per year. With exemplary forestry, we can basically double the average productivity per acre per year of New England forests on an average basis. That lets you do two things. It lets you store more carbon in the living forest. You have more volume of wood on a given acre of land. And it also lets you continue to harvest wood create wood products and long lived wood products like wood flooring, like wood paneling, tables and wood buildings, all keep that carbon dioxide locked out of the atmosphere. Together, this can be an important new climate wedge. This is very much in line with what the IPCC has called for, uh, where they call for sustainable forest management to maintain forest carbon sinks and enhance forest carbon stocks. So sinks are the, uh, the amount that's coming out of the atmosphere each year. Stocks are the amount stored in living forests. And then long lived wood products that can substitute for emissions intensive materials. So let's look briefly at these three components. First of all, ending forest conversion. It doesn't matter whether you're talking about burning in the Amazon to create agricultural lands or clearing as in this photo in Vermont for new solar fields or for residential development, all of those three are reducing our future sequestration capacity, our future ability to generate renewable materials for our future economy. That needs, we need to work to end all aspects of forest conversion. We need to manage forests better. This is the most complex graph I'm gonna show you. Uh, it's a, it, it's a, it shows the amount of growth versus stocking. This is a format that foresters use regularly. And um, when a forest is between the B and the A line, it is using all of the light energy that is reaching it. Uh, and that, that's a good thing. We're converting all of the light into wood and the sugars that trees use for their day-to-day -day existence. Right now in New England, we have significant numbers of forests that are not stocked between the A, B and the A line, that have fewer trees or smaller trees. And many of those may even be below the C line, at which point we are letting light energy go unused. We need to change that. If we do change that, here's what can happen. These are results from five forests owned by New England Forestry Foundation, where we have at least 30 years of record as well as uh, one forest that uh, used to be owned by Professor, uh, Professor Seymour at the University of Maine. In all of these cases, you can see that the initial stocking shown in the left-hand bar is lower than the final stocking. There's more carbon in the trees at the end of the time period than at the beginning. And yet still, 
we were able to continue to harvest timber shown in the, in the red and pink. The red is that saw timber that's suited for long lived forest products. So in all of these cases, stocking increased and harvest continued. This is what exemplary forestry can do and similar approaches. Finally, what about wood buildings? This is the, a picture of the RIS, new dorm at RISD right there in Rhode Island. And um, it's one of what I think of as sort of two flagship uh, cross laminated timber buildings here in New England. And by doing, by building buildings out of wood instead of, of steel and concrete, we avoid the emissions that would be generated by that steel and concrete. You have to heat both of those materials to 2,500 degrees Fahrenheit in order to produce them. Uh, car, concrete production alone is responsible for about 10% of our global emissions. If we build with wood, we never emit that carbon. In addition, the structure of the building stores carbon long-term that can be, that is harvested from the forest and now it's locked up in the building. Now, of course, it was in the trees beforehand, but we're seeing that globally rates of forest disturbance are increasing due to climate change. This is, it, over time, it will become more and more important that we, be, we have a mechanism to capture carbon from the forest and lock it up for the long term. Finally, because cross-laminated timber can enable denser development around transportation hubs, um, because it allows construction affordably in the six to 12 story range that currently you see virtually nothing built in, it will enable a denser pattern of development that can reduce residential sprawl. That's a huge benefit. So think, what's this look like in a New England context? The orange on this graph shows emissions uh, here in New England uh, from 1990 to 2017. The brown wedge, particularly the top of that brown wedge, shows the emissions that we can emit to 2050 if we're going to get to net zero. So we need to have, again, this very steep decline starting right away. So now I've added in this gray triangle the needed emissions reductions relative to if we just continued emissions today at their current level. And that is about two gigatons of carbon dioxide equivalent that we need to not emit. How much of that can forests do? A very large amount, about a third by New England Forestry Foundation's calculations. That is huge. Forests, if we take care of them right, if we use them right, and if we save them from being converted, can do a third of what we need between now and 2050. And they can be there for us and be ready to go for the next phase of climate mitigation. We cannot afford to lose that capability. Here's a little bit of detail on that wedge, that green wedge in the previous slide. Uh, about 100 million tons of carbon dioxide comes from either avoiding conversion of forests or from the benefits of mass timber buildings. This isn't reflecting all the other wood buildings that already are being built or could be built using other technologies. And then the biggest part of the wedge is coming from improving forestry. And this is particularly focused in Northern Maine uh, and Western Maine and down East Maine and also Northern New Hampshire. The industrial forest lands of Northern New England that are owned by individuals and companies largely for the, the benefits of those forests financially. They're, they're, in the, they're in it as a business proposition. And right now they are not getting paid for carbon in a simple enough way and a high enough value way that that's what they're managing their forests for. So they're managing it for maximum productivity or at least maximum short-term production. And that's resulting in less carbon stocking than those forests could have. If we want that to change, we need to think about how we meet the needs of those landowners. So here's a set of recommendations. First of all, no net loss of forests. We need to go that way as part of the Resilient Lands Initiative in Massachusetts that has recommended that. And part of that needs to be stopping incentivizing forest clearing uh, as Scott spoke to. That means increased incentives for solar in developed areas. So that's more appealing. This picture is a solar canopy in the REI parking lot in Natick, Massachusetts. 
I've been to this parking lot many times because I like REI. And um, I can tell you, it's really nice to have a solar canopy. Your car is cooler in the summer. When you step out in the rain, you have time to put up your umbrella before you get wet. And in the winter, you don't have to worry about clearing your car when you come out from shopping. Every parking lot should have solar canopies. Every rooftop should have solar before we ever clear an acre for solar. We also need more funding and support for forest conservation and for improved management. And I know there's a bill here in Rhode Island to, um, to advance forest conservation and provide some additional funding for it. There's approaches uh, being thought about for that in Massachusetts as well. Um, forest conservation is important as an option for landowners who otherwise need to sell their land for whatever reason and otherwise are faced with what are they gonna sell it for? Something that's other than forest. We need to improve our forest management and there's a couple of pieces to that. Uh, first of all, we need to recognize that not just stopping harvest or reducing harvest may not do very much at all. In part because wood, as I spoke to earlier, substitutes for more carbon intensive materials like steel and concrete, but also we live in a global wood market if we reduce harvest in one place, the research shows that it just gets harvested somewhere else. And I'd rather have, for, have forest products sustainably harvested from the forests of New England than I would uh, to see the clearing of primary forests in other parts of the world or, the, uh, or some of the uh, negative consequences environmentally that are associated with intensive plantation growth. We need to simplify payments for carbon storage. Jeff Bezos has been um, has said that his key innovation in Amazon was making it easy for people to spend their money, very focused on being able to get to the place where you have to click once to spend your money. But we need to make it so that forest landowners essentially only have to click once to get paid for storing carbon. That will make a dramatic difference. And we need to provide improved access to forestry expertise and make it sort of standard that landowners turn to foresters and turn to uh, understanding what advanced silviculture can do uh, before they start harvesting. We need to make wood buildings soar. This is Bob Purcell, the Executive Director of New England Forestry uh, Foundation speaking in the UMass design building, the John W. Olver design building named after the visionary former Congressman John Olver. That's, the, that's an amazing building. It's beautiful. It's made of CLT. It's got the first CLT cores anywhere in the world. It's a great building. We can do more with wood buildings. And we can do that by adopting the 2021 revisions in the International Building Code, which is the code that applies to US and Canada. That's why it's international. Uh, we need to incentivize mass timber for public buildings so that our public funds are going to such a climate beneficial outcome. We need to establish embodied carbon tracking for all buildings so we can see over time how is the amount of carbon that is expended in constructing a building changing. And we need to incentivize local wood manufacturing for some of these new engineered wood products. If we do that, we get huge benefits. We, don't, we not only get the significant climate mitigation wedge, and we not only can at the same time help make our forests more resilient to climate change, improve climate adaptation, but we also get economic benefits for rural communities. We can get better, more equitable, more affordable housing. We can improve mobility and reduce sprawl, and we can maintain all the many benefits of forests in terms of wildlife habitat, clean air, clean water, recreational opportunity. This is a, not just a win-win strategy. This is a win-win-win-win-win-win-win strategy. 